Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for your spirit being among us. And just thank you for your provision for this day. Here we are. We simply want to lift your name up in the midst of those that are here with us today. Psalm 123. It's super, super, super long. It's four verses. Don't worry. We're good. We're going to do something a little old-fashioned here, if you don't mind. Uh, If you're able to, would you mind standing while we read this? If you're not able to, you're totally good. And we're going to read this out loud together, beginning now. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. Father, thank you for your word that it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We come to you now and ask that you'd speak to us by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Anybody remember a guy by the name of Napoleon? (laughs) And I'm not talking necessarily like Napoleon Dynamite. Okay, you might, yes, yes, Bonaparte, yes. The man who was known for not being the greatest of stature, supposedly I'm about five feet seven. How many here today five feet seven or below? Yeah, five foot seven. Well, he may have been short in stature, but he's considered one of the greatest tactical military minds of his time, which would have been the early 1800s during the French Revolutionary War. But there's a story that's told that there was a day that a mother approached him. This mother's son had been found guilty of two heinous crimes under Napoleon's rule as emperor, and she basically came begging mercy for her son. Napoleon said he has been found guilty of two heinous crimes, and both of these crimes are punishable by death. He deserves to die. The mother looked at Napoleon and said, I know that he deserves to die. I'm asking you to give him mercy. Napoleon looked at the mother and says, he doesn't deserve mercy. The mother looked at Napoleon and said, if he deserved mercy, I wouldn't be here. He doesn't deserve it or it wouldn't be mercy, but I'm asking for mercy. Napoleon looked at the mother. Hmm. He doesn't deserve mercy, but it's mercy that you ask for, and it's mercy that I will grant. Guy didn't get what he deserved. He got mercy. I don't know about you. Any of us like mercy? Oh, Anybody think of anything that happened this week or sometime during your life to where you got mercy? How did it feel? Amazing, right? Amazing, absolutely amazing. This passage of scripture that we're gonna look at today, Psalm 123, I've titled our message, is that the Lord is full of mercy. God Almighty who reigns in heaven, he is full of mercy. And not only is he full of mercy, God loves to give mercy out. God loves to give out his mercy. And I don't know what type of background that you were raised in, but I was raised in a religious background to where God wasn't told, I wasn't told that God liked to give out mercy. I was told that God loved to spank you hard. My dad was a drill instructor in the army. So basically, his way or the highway, and if you didn't do it his way, it was met with a very quick swat. And my dad's forearms were bigger than my calves and my thighs are now. It was like I was, my dad was like Popeye or something, right? And so when you grow up thinking that that's the representation of God in your life is that he simply wants to make you feel pain, you lose sight of the fact of the reality of what scripture tells us is that God is full of mercy. And so this morning, I pray that this message uh, blesses us all. As we continue in our study uh, of the songs of ascent, 
Psalms 120 to Psalm 134 are grouped together in what's referred to as the songs of ascent. It's what the people of Israel used to actually sing as they would go up during the three times of the year where they went to the big church gatherings where everybody would come from all over the world because God said, hey, three times a year I want you to gather like this so that they would remember who he was. And I don't know if you've been with us or if you haven't been with us, there's been a progression since we started with Psalm 120. So this will kind of catch everybody up to where else to where we're at now. In Psalm 120, we see the establishment of a relationship between God and people. And that once that establishment of relationship happens, guess what? You realize that as a human being in Psalm 121, you have problems. Anybody relate to that? That you have problems in life? And then when you have problems in life, the question is now what do you do? In Psalm 122, we see, hey, I'm gonna either bury my head in the sand and hope that the problems go away. And does that really work? Or I can make a choice to look up in faith and say, wow, I'm gonna lift my eyes up and say, God, I need your help. And as we come in to today, uh, after seeing this progression for looking up to the hills and then looking up to the city of Jerusalem, God's place on earth, uh, during the time that we're reading from, we're gonna see that today, it's all about the fact that the ultimate goal is not for us simply to look up to someplace high, but to look up to God himself because there is no higher place to look than to God himself. And so this morning, I pray that you're blessed as we go through this together because the psalmist starts in Psalm 120 in verse one. He says, I lift up my eyes. Why do we lift our eyes up? Yeah, there's usually the implication there that your eyes, before you lifted them up, were looking where? Down. It's called the gravity of life. And I don't care what socioeconomic situation you're in, people got problems. The guy who lives in the palatial mansion, who's Forbes, one of Forbes' top 10 most richest people on the planet, you know what? He's got problems. Now, his problems may be di- different than those of you who happen to live on the street, but he's still got problems. We all have problems. Life has gravity, and so we're gonna find ourselves at times when our eyes are down, when we're in despair. So do we make this choice to look up, to lift up our eyes? Listen to what it says in another place in Psalms, 42.5, right up here. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. When we're down and out, when we're going through super hard times, we have choices to make. And we can choose to dwell in our misery or we can choose to, in faith, say, hey God, I just need your presence. I really need out of the situation I'm in right now, but right now I just need to know that you're there. And I know that for many people there are times that you've been in spots like this and you've cried out and you've felt that God didn't answer or that God wasn't there. But I'm here to tell you that according to Scripture and according to what many people have come to realize, just because he doesn't feel like he's there doesn't mean that he's not there. It's like the air. Can't see it, can't taste it, hopefully, unless you're in like LA or New York City on a bad day, right? But the reality of it is, is that we know that it's there, why? Because we're not going, I can't breathe, there's no air, right? So in essence, our spirits are crying out and saying, God, we know that you're there, will we trust that he is there? Because while scripture tells us right here that he's the one that dwells in the heavens, doesn't mean that he's not right here. Matter of fact, what scripture talks about is the fact that God is so infinitely big that he's actually bigger than what we actually know as, know as the universe. Scripture says that the span of his hand, from the end of his thumb to the end of his pinky, that's how big the universe is. And so I know that kind of is like mind-blowing. I was like, dang, wow. That's the reality of God. He's the dang wild God. He blows us away if we'll look to see who he really is and trust that he's there and believe in faith. So this one who dwells in in the heavens, this is the same one who would walk this planet in the incarnation of Jesus and tell us this in John 15, 4. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch can bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the fine, 
neither can you unless you abide in me. God wants us to see that his desire for us is to make him our home. Now, please, I, I've never been homeless. And I've, through my 55 years in my journey, I've spent a lot of time with people who have been called homeless. But for those of you who actually are quote unquote homeless, would you agree that you're not necessarily homeless? Thank you. Because this is what I've said, because with the people that I've talked to, because there was a time, uh, I spent a lot of time in Hawaii um, where it's a lot easier to be without a house because the weather is warm most of the time. But a good number of the people that I met simply didn't have a house because there was a time when the rent rates just got jacked up like two and a half times and it was allowed. And so basically people who had a house the week before now didn't, but they still had jobs. They still had their cars. They still had all the accoutrements of their house and they basically moved down to the beach and now they were driving to work. And so I realized then as I was talking to them, I'm going, wait a minute, they're being grouped and called homeless, but really, no, they're not homeless. They're simply houseless because wherever it is that you basically end up being, you're home, right? right? There are certain places within the city that to you, you feel like at home, regardless or not if you have a quote unquote house home there. And so this is what scripture, I believe, is trying to get through to us. And listen to this in what Paul would say later to a young pastor named Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into the temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Did you pick up on there what the Holy Spirit was speaking through an older pastor telling a young pastor about contentment and what it is that we, if we're gonna follow God should be content with. Verse eight, having food and clothing with these shall we be content. Is there something missing there that many of us in this room have that maybe we take for granted and that many of us don't have in this room that would actually kind of like to have? Yeah, lots of things, right? But one thing that comes to mind right off the bat, it's a house. That's nowhere in there. And so as somebody who was spending his life simply like that song, gonna tell the whole world about Jesus, he realized that, hey, if I've got food and I've got clothing, I'll be content. Because along the way, I will have shelter. It'll be different, it'll vary. I might not have it at all, but the reality of it is, I'm gonna be content. I'm gonna make a choice to say, you know what, God, you've provided food and clothing, so I'm gonna be content. And the psalmists, as they write these things, it's amazing. I was talking uh, last week with somebody who was just like, ah, I'm not really getting much from my Bible. I said, I don't care, just keep reading it and go to the Psalms. Because when you read the Psalms, you get people who weren't getting much out of their relationship with God often. And they're calling out to God and they're being totally real and honest with God. God, are you asleep? God, are you there? God, did you forget me? God bless you. You're sneezing, right? And so these words are not just words. They're the very love words from God. It's a love letter to us. The psalmist continues in verse two. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of the masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hands of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. How should we look when we're looking towards God? According to scripture, like a servant looks to the master, like the maid or a hand servant looks to her mistress. Now, for us, many, I know this is like, wow, that's way out of my realm of experience. I've never been a servant to anybody. I've never had servants. But the process of thinking through here is that how would a servant look to their master? Obviously, this was written at a time where we're not necessarily talking about Alex Haley's roots here. We're not talking about slavery. 
but we are talking about a situation to where there's a relationship and work to where you see your place as serving someone else. And as you are serving them and as they're providing for you, they're actually pretty good about it and they're nice about it. So in essence, this would kind of be like a good work relationship. And you could easily kind of transfer into this, look to the way that you would look towards a good boss. Anybody ever had a good boss? Yeah, I hope you have. Because most of us have definitely had some bad bosses along the way in life, right? But if you've had a good boss, how would you look towards them? You're usually pretty thankful. I remember when I used to manage a surf shop in San Diego, and the guy who owned it, to me, was the most godly man I'd ever met, but he wasn't a professing believer in Jesus. Totally sold out for his wife, totally sold out for the moral things of the truths of Scripture, but not a professor in Christ, but a whole lot more in action, practicing things of Christianity than a lot of my Christian friends were at the time. And I always used to think about that, and dang, this is like wrong, but in such a cool way, right? It's that this man has actually bought into the truths of God and his Christ, but not yet the Christ, not yet. I'm glad to say that he has now. But at that time, he was buying into the things of the truth. And this is the type of person, whenever I read this, I always think about, that that's the way that we, God wants us to see him as. He wants us to see him as somebody who has provided for us very well. And I know that there are times when all of us don't think that God's a very good provider. But the fact of the matter is, if we can look to the fact, food, clothing, and be content with that, then guess what? Absolutely. And then everything else beyond that, it's bonus. It's extra. But this brings it all back down to us as far as are we going to actually submit? Are we actually going to yield and say, okay, God, I don't get it, but it's your way, not mine. Because we have, most of us have been raised, right? Burger King generation. Have it your way, right? I have to have it my way because I want it that way, right? I, 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 sorry, songs just always seem to come out of my head right there. And I saw you right there in the red going, man, is he just quoting back? Is that a backstreet? But no, yeah, normally it's like heavy rock and roll from the 70s that I'm quoting, but that, that one just snuck out there. Do we submit because here's the problem that we see here in this passage is that there's submission and what's the opposite of submission? Rebellion. rebellion and rebellion is spurred by this word that begins with P and ends with an E. Pride. Yeah. It's what brings us to the fact to where we won't want to submit that we'll actually reject that which God would have for us that may not feel good but it's actually what he has for us. Listen to what John wrote in 1 John 2. For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father. It's of the world. And so we need to understand that, hey, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, that we have to yield to the fact that, hey, it's your way, not my way. And in his way is not always pleasant for us. Following Christ is a road that's marked with suffering. But here's the thing. How many of us have ever read anything in Scripture that made us think that Jesus lived a life that was totally easy street? You know what Jesus was basically thought of all of his life? He was a bastard. It's not recorded in Scripture that they actually came out and called him it, but the fact of the matter is we understand that's exactly what they thought, right? Right? And sure enough, here he is, God in the flesh, who emptied himself of all of his heavenly privileges to come down and pay the price for sin for those who would actually look at him and think that of him when it wasn't true. Anybody here ever feel like people think things about them that aren't true, that's hurtful? All the time. Absolutely all the time. We live in a world and a society right now at a time today that is extremely judgmental. Wouldn't you agree? That maybe before you even has said a single word to somebody, you can tell they've already judged me. They already think they know me. And not only do they think they know me, they think that I'm not worth knowing because they've already judged me. 
Yeah, sound familiar? Psalm was here saying, hey, guess what, guys? This is the way that life is going to be. And what you're going through this right now is that, hey, we got to look up to God and say, God, we need you to have mercy on us. And until you have mercy on us, what are we going to do? We're going to keep looking to you because you're the source of mercy and you're full of mercy. Until he has mercy on us means as long as it takes. The reality that most people will explain to you that have walked with Jesus for months, years, decades, God really allows us to wait a lot. How many of us like to wait? Most of us don't. But the reality of it is, is that he's a loving God and it's a good dad that makes his kids wait on certain things, yeah? To give your kids everything they want when they want it produces what? Brats. It produces verrucas, right? Daddy, I want an Oompa Loompa now, right? <laughs> All right, Wonka, how much for an Oompa Loompa? Oh, they're not for sale. Oh, everything's got a price, Wonka, right? That's what happens when we get everything that we want when we want it. Because a good dad realizes that, no, what you want right now isn't good for you. And that's exactly who our heavenly father is. But there are times that as we're gonna sit and wait for him, we simply have to wait until he brings that mercy that we so need. Mercy literally means to bend or stoop in kindness. It has the picture of something or someone that's greater, lowering themselves to the level of where somebody who's in need is at and being kind to them. Anybody like kindness? Yeah. And we're not talking here about random acts of kindness. We're talking about intentional acts of kindness. This is my absolute favorite word in the Hebrew language. It's hesed, and I'm sorry for the picture, but you'll never forget it. Because it looks like cheese head or cheese, and I'm sorry for those of you who aren't Packers fans this morning. It's good that Carl's not in here, that he's, or did you, yeah? Oh, you are here. <laughs> he was texting me last night, I think I'm gonna have the older kids go with me or stay, I don't know. And I said, well, just make a decision in the morning. And I thought, Lord, it'll be your will if he goes, because I'm actually going to put a picture of Aaron Rodgers on the thing, and this is not Carl's favorite person on the planet. <laughs> Where's Alex, though? <laughs> Alex is out there. See, oh, I got it wrong. So Alex is out with the kids, and this is his, one of his favorite people on the planet. But hesed is the Hebrew word that gets translated often loving kindness in the Bible but it's a word that is all throughout the Old Testament. But what it is, is intentional acts of kindness, and the dot, dot, dot is this. It's intentional acts of kindness done to somebody, though they may be a stranger, as if they were a family member. Does that make sense? It's intentional acts of kindness done to somebody, though they may be a stranger, as if they were a fam, uh, and, and the implication is that it's a family member that you like. It's, it's not weird Aunt Ethel, okay, right? It's not crazy Uncle George. It's, no, these are family members that you would actually like, but it's actually done in that way to where though this person's a stranger, wow, it's as if they were. Um, I only use this as an example because it happened last night. As I was going to buy soft drinks for our lunch this afternoon, the lady in front of me was checking out, and basically when she went to pay, she didn't have enough money. She goes, oh, I've got to get rid of some stuff. And I'm sitting behind her. And I'm going, no, you don't. She goes, she looked at me and goes, no, I'll take care of it. And now here, as I said, this is just for an example. Not to puff me up, but the fact of the matter is, is this, is that the lady looked at me, and I, number one, she thinks I'm crazy, right? Because we live in a 21st century America where people just don't do things like this anymore, right? But I come grown up from a small town in the Midwest where that would be expected of everybody and it would be normal, okay? And so when this happened, she looked at me and she goes, are you serious? I said, yeah. I said, it's not that much money, it's okay. God just wants to let you know that he loves you, girl. 
her, and then me, <laughs> right? And it's one of those things, that's what his said is. It's an intentional act, and it wasn't like when it happened, I'm oh man, this is gonna make extra time, you know? No, but it was literally like the spirit of God within me got this opportunity to work through my physical. <laughs> that's on camera. Wow, thanks Lord, that was amazing but simply to bless somebody else so that they would know that there is a God in heaven still who is alive on planet Earth, and when his people act in faith, guess what? They can see him, and that's what he said is, and this is that God who mercifully bends and stoops down to us. And if the picture of Aaron Rodgers sticks with you, at least you'll remember, but I'm sorry about that, okay? Because this whole concept of God being merciful is all throughout scripture, and there's a great passage in uh, the book of Exodus, verses 32 to 34. Highly recommend you go read it uh, this afternoon. But simply, it's Moses, after having gotten the two plus million people out of Egypt, and obviously Moses didn't do it. God did all the things, did the 10 amazing miracles to get them to that place. But he gets to this place to where he's gone through all that with the Lord, but he asks God a simple question. Show me your way, go with us, and show me your glory. Three things in that question. Number one, show me your way. He says, show me how to live like you want me to live so I can do it. And then second thing is, if we ain't going with you, we shouldn't be going at all. We need your presence. And when God said yes to those first two things, he finally went for the third one, and you know, this is the big swing. He said, show me your glory. In other words, I wanna see you face to face. God lovingly just goes right into, I'm going to make all my goodness pass. He basically is answering yes, but he's giving him the conditions that I'm going to do this and it won't kill you. Because if I were to grant exactly what you want right now, you'd be dust. You'd be vaporized like that because of my holiness and you're not. And so he does it, but listen to this. This is what's recorded in scripture. As God says, he's going to proclaim all of his goodness before he lets Moses see his backside. Exodus 34, verses five to seven up on the screen. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with them there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Did you pick up on the very first adjective that God himself used to describe himself as he proclaimed his goodness? Merciful. If somebody asked you to describe yourself in three words, three adjectives, what would be the first word that you would use thinking about yourself? Most of us would think handsome, <laughs> intelligent. Here's the God of the universe. What's the very first thing that he wants us to know about him? He's merciful. He's full of mercy. Later, he would actually show this in the Ark of the Covenant and how he designs it. He gives them a picture of where the law would go in, but on the top would be something that he would refer to as the mercy seat. And that's where God would meet with the high priest on behalf of the people at the mercy seat. But the greatest picture of all, if you ever need to be reminded of the fact that God is merciful, comes at the cross. Ephesians 2, 4, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. No greater picture to us, beloved, than the cross because at the cross, God himself took the payment for all of your and my sins. So we, with the psalmist in verse three, can call out to him, have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. We're literally calling out to the God in heaven, bend your knee down and meet us where we're at because we need you. Why? Because we are exceedingly filled with contempt. We're filled with disrespect. We're filled with disregard. We are filled with shame. That's what it means to be filled with contempt. 
Now the people of Israel that are singing this and the psalmist that wrote this wasn't talking necessarily about something that welled up with them. He's talking about that in life, they as a people group are despised by the rest of the people around them. They're filled with contempt. Why? Because others are throwing contempt at them. Others are throwing disrespect at them. Others are throwing shame and disregard at them. Sound familiar, anybody? Here is the God of the universe telling you that he understands and that these who are writing this understand and they're gonna make choices to say, you know what? God, we need your mercy in this situation. Isn't it interesting here that we don't see that, hey, God, we need a 12-step approach to how do we get rid of the contempt? No, actually, God, we just need you to be merciful in our situations and you to work this out on our behalf. Why? Verse four, our soul is exceedingly filled. God, if you didn't hear us the first time saying that we're filled, let's just qualify a, a little bit more. We're exceedingly filled. We're overflowing with scorn of those who are at ease the contempt of the proud that are around us. God understands. Don't we ever forget that he wanted to make sure that we understood so clearly that when Jesus came, he was born in a barn, right? That when Jesus, the king of the universe, came, he came in a situation to where the world was gonna call him a bastard. He came into a situation to where he was going to be seen as a poor carpenter, a poor laborer in the trades of what we would call now construction. He was going to be somebody that all throughout his life was going to be misunderstood and thought things about that had absolutely no basis in truth. And though he had the power to snap his fingers and get rid of all of those who thought those things, did he? Because he knew that his purpose on earth was to bring the mercy of God. He would be the one who would take the wrath for the scorn and bring the mercy of those who were at ease and that contempt of those and the proud. Hey, Wes, throw up that picture of Daffy. Oh, he did already? Wow, nobody even giggled at that one, huh? <laughs> No greater picture with those of us who remember growing up of, right? You, you're right. You're, what's the classic line from him? You're despicable, right? I don't know why that seemed to resonate with so many of us as kids growing up, but it's the reality of growing up is that oftentimes our quote-unquote friends would often make us feel, how? Despicable, scorned, shamed. And it, guess what? It didn't necessarily stop when we got a little older, did it? It actually got worse, and the words and the language became worse. This scorn and this contempt of the proud is what often plagues the soul of the human being. So the question is, what do we do with the contempt and the scorn? And this is where we finish up today. What do we do with the contempt and the scorn? Because the contempt and the scorn, if it continues to be allowed to accumulate, it'll eventually do what? Overflow. It'll eat us up. And not only will it eat us up, it'll eat others up as well. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 11. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Often the lessons in Scripture are very direct and very straight, but they're not necessarily easily applied in life. So for each and every one of us who are dealing with contempt and scorn that has been heaped upon us and like a vase or a glass, a mug, however you want to see it, that it's been filled up within us and it's eating away at us and maybe it's spilling over and eating away at others. The solution is to forgive. To forgive those people that wrongly look at us 
that wrongly accuse us, that wrongly cast disregard and shame our way. And understand this, your God understands that it's hard because from the cross, I don't know about you, after the beating that he took and the humiliation that he's now going through, these words are recorded in scripture. Father, forgive them who did this to us. They didn't know what they're doing. And beloved, I tell you this, do any of us remember that maybe there were times that we acted in ignorance as well? Nobody's guiltless in this area. Nobody except for Christ himself. So as we know that it's hard, the truth of scripture says this is the way. This is the path. And if we'll take the steps of faith to walk into the hard truths of scripture, guess what? Who's the beneficiary? I have a friend who's got a saying, and I don't know if it's his or he borrowed it. Unforgiveness is like me drinking poison and expecting you to get hurt. We're so honored that we're here today, Father, in your presence. We're thankful for your truths. And God, we simply desire it to be more like you. And so thanks for what you're doing here right now in our midst and as we respond to your message right now through song or for those of you who are here and if you want to possibly have communion privately on your own, the elements are to your right. But God, we simply desire this day to when we leave this place to have a slightly better understanding of who you are and how you desire us to be. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you gave us not only the words to live by, but you lived by those words. And as this day we respond, would you be glorified in our midst? Would you simply meet us where we're at? And what's your response today, those you've heard, whether you're here in person or whether you'll watch this on the internet or however else, through the church app, however, what's your response? What is our response to the truth that our God is a merciful God, but he also lets us know that he desires us to be merciful towards others and to forgive as well. Help us this morning, God, as we ponder these things over the course of the next few minutes through this song.